Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Uh, tonight we're going to deal with a topic that I've actually spent some time researching over the last few years, uh, really to confirm a suspicion that I had about the nature of the so-called Cold War between the Western powers and the Soviet Union. And the thesis that I want to promote tonight and defend is one that I've said on this show before, and that is that the Western powers routinely, as a matter of day-to-day -day policy, uh, traded with, invested in, and aided the Soviet Union throughout its existence. Uh, now, what I mean more specifically is this. We're all taught pretty early on that there was this war between the communist east uh, russia and the um and and the russian empire and then the eastern bloc later to become the warsaw pact after world war 2 and the west roughly the nato countries and there was this war over ideology bolshevism versus capitalism totalitarianism versus liberal democracy that sort of thing and i want to say that that thesis is highly problematic while it's true that at least after World War II, starting in the 1950s, there was fairly regular, um, regular government and military conflict between the U.S. and the Soviet Union on almost every continent. That's true. But the real problem is, is that how do we explain the fact that from 1925 to the reign of Mikhail Gorbachev there is um, there is uh, a tremendous amount of aid and assistance and trade uh, between the Soviet Union and Western capitalists um, that suggests that there you know there was a government policy that was part of the Cold War mentality but the uh, attitude of Western capitalists, corporations and banks and firms and the NATO countries, uh, says something completely different, that, that these people were not interested in a Cold War and that um, uh, they bankrolled the Soviet Union. And I want to make it clear that Soviet uh, industry and Soviet uh, economic growth had as much to do with Western capitalist investment and aid and advice and technical assistance to the USSR as any particular policy of the Soviet Union. And so tonight I'm going to deal with three academic papers, three academic papers dealing with different but strategic eras in Soviet history. Uh, the first uh, concerns uh, Franco-German um, uh, economic cooperation in investing in the Soviet Union, between 1926 and 1929, and that's written by Michael uh, Carley and Richard Debo. Uh, the second concerns uh, the post-war mentality um, of the um, uh, of the Marshall Plan and other aid programs. Uh, an article um, written by Susan Lintz in the Journal of Economic History in 1985, and then lastly, um, Western capitalist aid to the Soviet Union uh, during the Reagan administration. And this article is written by uh, Michael Massanduno uh, in World Politics, uh, also in 1985. So the first paper I want to deal with concerns uh, Weimar Germany and um, its competition with both France and Great Britain uh, to invest in and support the fledgling post-Civil War Soviet economy. And this article is published in French Historical Studies in 1997. And what these guys really do is they reprint quite a bit of the diplomatic uh, correspondence between uh, or among um, the defeated Germany, now Weimar Germany, Great Britain and France, and then their collective relationships with the Soviet Union. The fact is, is that these three powers were investing heavily in this new Soviet economy. The Soviet Union is coming out of World War I and the Civil War. The Bolsheviks only have a shaky grip on power in the early 20s. 
Lenin dies in um, 1925, and the Germans, under the Weimar government, the German banks and and um, and some firms, including those other Western countries, you know, the U.S. and Great Britain, who had invested in Weimar Germany, uh, begin shifting wealth and investment money to the Soviet Union. Um, and really the only concern that the Western powers had in bankrolling the Soviets in this period of time was that since uh, the Soviets had repudiated Tsarist debt, the banks were concerned that their loans that they're floating to the USSR won't be repaid. And if they if they um, repudiated the Tsarist debts, then maybe they'll repudiate V's. It didn't um, it didn't stop them from continuously loaning money to the Soviet government. And I want to say that it's this Western capitalist support of the Soviet Union in the mid twenties, mid to late twenties, uh, that ensured Soviet survival in this first generation of um, of Soviet existence. But in all of this diplomatic chatter that um, these two authors lay out and translate, uh, there's no concern at all about socialism or Marxism. They don't care about that. They only care about the creditworthiness of the new government. And in fact, they didn't really care who took over. It was just a matter of having someone take over and impose some kind of order over the um, uh, over the society. But these two authors make it clear that from uh, the Bolshevik victory in the Russian Civil War uh, right up until 1930, uh, Western banks were floating a large uh, series of loans to the Soviet Union. And what the USSR began to do, uh, to some extent under Trotsky's leadership, is play country against country, bank against bank, because Western banks saw Russia as a, you know, a country that had tremendous potential. And if it just had a government to keep order over the society, it can create not only tremendous economic growth, that Russia could be a new market that uh, Western European uh, conglomerates could, could break into, that banks could make a lot of money on the restructuring of uh, this new society. And uh, from the German point of view, from Weimar's point of view, these two authors, uh, Carly and Debo, uh, prove clearly that Germany's interest was avoiding the prejudice of the Allies, of rebuilding its economy on Russian soil, so as to avoid some of the strictures of the Versailles Treaty, and kind of avoiding... Um, the uh, really the, the rapacious attitude and actions of the Allies after World War One. Not to mention the fact that the Weimar diplomats, um, as as proven in this particular piece, viewed the Soviet Union as an ally, not as an adversary in any way, because they wanted a strong Russia to control um, the post-war Poland which, as most of you know, was reconstituted as a fairly large state uh, with a substantial military. And Germany, uh, being broken by World War I, uh, supporting the Soviet Union as a means of um, uh, controlling Poland, as well as controlling the Versailles partners that helped to create uh, this new Poland. So in 1926, uh, the German-Soviet Treaty was signed. And this was a treaty essentially um, creating uh, economic avenues of cooperation between the Soviets and uh, the Germans. And not only uh, was money and technical assistance being forwarded to the Soviet Union, but also grain and other foodstuffs being grown in Germany. And in this way, they can get, they could, they can get hard cash um, uh, from, uh, from the Soviet government. And so as Germans starved and went without medical care and everything else we know from the disaster of the Weimar experiment, Um, German money, German technical assistance, German investment, even some German industry and produce was being shipped to the Soviet Union um, in in conformity with the uh, 1926 treaty. Uh, 1924, a couple of years before this, 
the French and the British had recognized the Soviet Union as a legitimate government. And between 24 and 26, the French in particular uh, were investing very, very heavy in Russian, or I should say Soviet, um, oil and natural gas, both exploration, refining, and uh, transportation. So in the first few years of the Soviet uh, experiment, uh, just before Lenin's death, much of this economic growth, in fact, is coming from Western investment. Of course, that doesn't quite square with the old mythology that these countries were somehow opposed to the Bolshevik takeover. They, it was no such thing. And the behavior of the capitalist class in this period of time um, uh, shows that. There was substantial trade and loans and investment and food assistance being delivered to the Soviet Union throughout the 1920s, and it's largely because of this that permitted uh, the Soviet Union to um, uh, not only you know, survive, but then grow economically. These two authors show that in 1927, about 500 million marks were transferred uh, as credits to uh, Soviet industry. And the point was is that Weimar is going to come out of its economic doldrums by building up the Soviet Union and then creating the Soviet market that then Germans could, could trade with. Um, and then once the French kind of got wind of this plan, they couldn't do much about it, and so they attempted to compete with Germany for investing in the Soviet Union. Essentially what, what's happening is that the Western allies view the Soviet Union as a potential market for their goods as that economy grows. And they know it's going to be a large economy. It's going to be a powerful economy. There's a lot of people living there. There's a lot of consumers there. They don't know that much about Bolshevism, really. Uh, but they do know it's worth uh, investing in. And so we're talking about this first generation of Soviet economic growth being largely the product of Western powers. And when I say Western powers, again... I'm talking about the capitalists, people who run the country, the banks and the big firms. The governments seem to be fairly irrelevant here. And the governments really can't control these extremely powerful corporations. And what you see over and over again um, is it, are, are governments being somewhat suspicious about the motives of their own capitalist classes, but being absolutely powerless to do anything uh, about it. Um and the Fr French banks, uh, they, they made several complaints between 1926 and 1927. And they worried about how the Soviet economy was being structured. Uh, impending collectivization, these kind of things. They really only w were concerned with, with whether or not the, com the, the, co the country is going to grow with this kind of economic system. It didn't stop them from sending $300 million dollars valued in American dollars in 1927. And that that loan uh, is, is one of the major um, infusions of cash that permitted the Soviet Union to really establish itself. Um, you need to ask yourself, when you're studying Soviet history, this, this very chaotic period of time between the end of the Civil War, say roughly 1921, the consolidation of Soviet power under Lenin and the new economic program, and then Lenin's death and the power struggle which eventually leads to Stalin taking over uh, at the end of the 1920s. The Soviet Union had lost a huge number of men, their best men, their strongest men, in the draft in World War I and in the Civil War. The economy was in a shambles. Uh, agriculture was in a shambles. Famine was everywhere. And yet, within a few years, the Soviet Union created modern heavy industry in the major cities of the country uh, to grow and expand under Stalin. There's no other explanation for this than a massive influx of money from German, French, and British banks uh, throughout the decade of the 1920s. 
And if you read this piece by Carly and Debo, uh, written in, or published in 1997, it will uh, disentangle a lot of the diplomatic and economic issues um, that went into uh, the financing of the Soviet Union. So uh, this, again, this is just the first of three pieces we're going to deal with. This is some very serious uh, revisionist material, only because these guys actually translate the letters and the, the conversations between major diplomatic figures uh, in the West as well as the Soviet Union in this very, very strategic period of time. Okay, um, the, the, the next thing uh, I, I'm going to deal with, uh, oh, but let me, let me just conclude here. Um, the way these, these authors estimate that the total credits that the Western powers combined uh, forwarded to, and they measure this in contemporary marks, between 1927 and 1929, the value of the mark between those uh, in that period is roughly about a billion marks a year. Uh, I'm not sure why they measure it in marks, uh, but I think because the, the Weimar German banks had taken the lead in investing and underwriting the Soviet Union, uh, they use marks, they use dollars in other places. I guess it really depends on what statistics they, they can get their hands on. But the point here is that the French and the Germans eventually cooperated in building up the Soviet Union as a means of creating a new market for continental European goods, given the scars of the First World War. The second article is um, published in the Journal of Economic History by Susan Lintz in 1985. And... Um, Again, this is a this is a revisionist piece in that it shows that between the end of World War II and then the end of the war in Korea, so from forty five to fifty three, the um, Western powers, and again by that I mean the economic elites in the NATO countries, right? Not necessarily the states, but when you read these three pieces. The states don't seem to have any function whatsoever. The corporations do as they please. The the governments just have to be quiet because the corporations and banks are far more powerful than governments are. Now, the big issue here is um, at the end of of the war, uh, Truman's um, uh, Secretary of of State, um, Marshall, of course, who the Marshall Plan is named after, uh, George C. Marshall um, wanted to rebuild the European economy, including that of the Soviet Union, and the uh, what it was called more formally the European Economic, uh, or the, excuse me, the European Recovery Program. Between forty-eight and fifty-two, had budgeted thirteen billion American dollars. Again, in 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 uh, in the contemporary uh, historical value of that money, uh, one half is going to go to Germany and France. And the other half is going to go to the USSR. The very fact that Truman's Secretary of State was going to give this what is essentially six point five billion dollars to the USSR for economic reconstruction, after financing to some extent anyway the the Soviet war effort in World War II, is suspicious. Especially, you know, especially this is the point where um, the Cold War is supposed to be beginning, and yet here is Truman's Secretary of State, you know, wanting to hand out this cash. Um, it should be noted, of course, that as, as we all know, the USSR rejected Marshall Plan assistance. And the motive for the Soviets doing this, in my opinion, is that because uh, the Marshall Plan required the countries involved to turn over their internal economic uh, statistics, the basic documents of how the economy is going and the plans and everything else. And that was a condition of getting this money. The Soviets did not want the West to know the structural issues within the Stalinist economy and the plans for the Stalinist economy. And that was probably the primary reason for their rejection of the Marshall Plan because they had been uh, certainly um, from the 20s right up through World War II have been receiving aid and support from the West. So that wasn't the issue. Receiving aid and support from the West, that's the only reason that the Soviet Union never, ever uh, survived the 1920s. Um, Susan Lynch quotes a British uh, economist, G. Warren Nutter, who uh, wrote a book in 1962 uh, dealing with 
Western aid and trade uh, with the Soviet Union from 1945 to 1953. And he estimates, although, although estimates are difficult here because um, uh, a lot of this stuff, uh, like technical assistance, for example, doesn't necessarily have a dollar amount attached to it, uh, like aid and trade turnover does. But all of this stuff taken into consideration, aid, trade, technical assistance, foreign investment in the USSR, it amounts between 45 and 53 to uh, between $9.1 billion a year, and that's again in 1945-53 value, uh, as a low estimate, and the high estimate is $21.2 billion a year. And Nutter, in his 62 work, um, had access to um, the, the uh, as many documents as you can get uh, back then to come up with with these figures, and much of it was either from post-war Germany or, as is more likely, funneled through post-war Germany. So, um, the NATO powers and the capitalists who dominate those powers underwrote. Uh, through all the means and, and, and methods that we've already mentioned, Stalin's reconstruction of the Soviet Union. Because even the low estimate of $9.1 billion a year, all things considered, is a huge chunk of the post-war Soviet economy. But it, it doesn't, you know, the whole issue uh, of, of Stalin rejecting uh, the Marshall Plan, uh, it it didn't make much difference because essentially what happened, according to Susan Lintz and her analysis of um, the collusion between U.S. banks and the Truman administration, in 1946, George Marshall, uh, who was Secretary of State, but, but, but the weight of the State Department had went to American banks, the major American banks, of course, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, and came up with $1 billion in 1946, do, you know, 1946 dollars, uh, and sent it as a loan to the Soviet Union. So, um, that's another proof, by the way, um, that the Soviets didn't care so much about receiving the, the aid from the West, it was the fact that they didn't want to turn over any economic documentation to the West. So while, you know, 47, 48, 49, the Soviets reject the Marshall Plan, um, they did accept, however, a billion-dollar loan from American banks, uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the skids there were greased by um, George C. Marshall himself and the Truman administration. Now, let me say something else here. Um, that, you know, we've proven with these two academic papers so far that Western capitalism had sent billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to the Soviet Union. Now, in two periods, the 20s and the late 40s and early 50s. Very strategic periods because they're both rebuilding eras. The first, the rebuilding after the Russian Civil War and World War One, and the second, the rebuilding of the Stalinist economy after World War II. And it should be noted that uh, the, the West, including American banks, um, are financing the Soviet Union as uh, the United States is suffering fighting the Soviet client state uh, in Korea, North Korea and China. And so as this war is going on, uh, and the government is warring, and the military is warring with the Soviet, well, not the Soviet Union directly, but their client states in, in China at the time, and North Korea. Um, American and Western capitalists are sending money and technical assistance to that very same Soviet Union. So, so far, I'm not seeing uh, a lot of evidence of a Cold War in an economic sense. I see that there's distrust between the U.S. government and the Soviet government. I'm not seeing it at the economic level. And I want to hold, um, uh, tentatively, take the view that the main reason that there was a, that there was conflict 
conflict on every continent practically uh, between the U.S. government and the Soviet government was that, not that the U.S. was in any way anti-communist. That's largely been proven to be false. There's too much money had been sent to the USSR for that to be the case. It's more that the Soviet Union, especially after the fall of China in 1949, was building a humongous closed market and industrial world based on the ruble. Remember, the idea was that America was going to reign supreme after World War II, and the Soviet Union was the only thing that stayed in the way. So I want to say that the Cold War, such as it was, was not a matter of ideology. It was a matter of the U.S. being very threatened by the fact that the Soviet Union... Eastern Europe, China, and then the revolutions that they were trying to start in the rest of the world, that this would create a huge Russian, uh, or I should say Soviet-dominated market and industrial center uh, that the U.S. could not match. And therefore, the Cold, War, Cold, the Cold War excuse me, was over that, not over any kind of ideological um, uh, disagreement. Okay, I've gone a little bit over here. Uh, we're going to go to a break now. We come back. I will finish this up. Hang in there. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalist. We are talking today about Western aid to the Soviet Union throughout its existence, um, which is kind of a, a kind of a way to challenge the idea that there were two blocks of countries sealed off from each other in a state of war. And I want to make the claim that the Soviet Union only was able to function and feed itself because of the huge loans, grants and aid, as well as trade and technical advice and everything else that these, you know, that the NATO countries were promoting. It's really the only thing that kept the Soviet Union alive. And that while the governments may have disagreed and may have fought in many ways, the fact is, is that through, um, the, um, the infant Soviet Union under Lenin, the reconstruction of the Soviet Union after World War II, uh, during the Korean War, during Vietnam, and straight up until the Reagan administration in the United States, Western capitalists have been financing and trading with and assisting the Soviet Union in any way possible. Now, this last paper I want to deal with was published in World Politics in 1985. And it deals with the early years of the Reagan administration and something that hasn't been dealt with in any detail. And that is Reagan's battle against American capitalists. Now, normally we don't think of Reagan as someone doing battle with capitalism, but there was a problem. Now, Reagan was elected in 79. Not only were American firms doing business with the Soviet Union, but Japanese and Western European firms were doing a brisk business with the Soviet Union. So apparently the Cold War existed only on occasion. From the economic point of view, there never was a Cold War. The trade between the NATO countries and the Soviet bloc was brisk and substantial through Korea and Vietnam. The idea, I guess, um, in Western European trade with the, um, I should say, NATO country trade with the Soviet Union was the idea that bringing Western know-how and ability to the Soviet Union might be a way to open the Soviets up. Open the Soviets up, of course, to more trade, to more Western goods. Generally speaking, the trade between the NATO countries and the Soviet Union was largely um, based on heavy industry. You know, we're talking you know, you know, iron and, and, and steel and coal and oil and natural gas building up the Soviet Union as a major power. This was done not only 
uh, because of the mobilization of labor within the USSR, but because of a huge influx of Western cash uh, throughout the existence of the Soviet Union, almost with no let-up. Every time, uh, for example, during uh, Khrushchev's uh, reign in the Soviet Union, any time the Soviet grain harvest would fail or was not good enough to feed the population, Archer Daniels Midland, based in uh, the U.S., of course, the Midwest, would send uh, grain shipments to the USSR, and not only to be sold, uh, but also uh, as aid to the Soviet Union. The famine that could have overthrown the Soviet government was never permitted to occur, because Western capitalists realized the money to be made in that economy, in a market of that size. And at least before the early 60s, the Sino-Soviet split, cozying up to the Soviet Union also meant the possibility of opening up the Chinese market. So like it or not, Reagan is elected and comes to power on an anti-communist platform, and he comes to uh, the president of the U.S., he comes to that office, realizing that every major firm dealing with uh, electronics, dealing with uh, coal and oil and natural gas and the processing of transportation, infrastructure, is doing a brisk trade with the Soviet Union that we were supposed to be at war against. From an economic point of view, there was no Cold War. There was constant trade and assistance from the Western powers to the USSR. The Reagan administration admits between 81 and 82, they admit publicly, as cited by this article, that the United States has been consistently selling sensitive high-tech items to the USSR, consistently over time. It's not an aberration, it's a normal part of American trade. And the Reagan administration is also forced to admit that this technology transfer and this trade in the high-tech sector between the USSR and the USA, never mind Western Europe, is a big part of uh, Soviet economic growth in the uh, 50s and 60s. Ronald Reagan, for his part, wanted to destroy this. Ronald Reagan wanted to eliminate all trading relations between the U.S. and the USSR. And one of the points of the Masunduno article is that Reagan failed. Reagan, outside of a couple of cosmetic prohibitions, was forced to back down. After the Korean War, all NATO firms are trading in assisting the USSR. They oppose vehemently any kind of credit control in terms of trade of the Soviet Union, forwarding cash, loaning them money. And the only real problem was is that from Western Western banks usually charge the Soviet Union a higher interest rate than they would uh, other other countries because partially partially because of Soviet um, um, the Soviets being very secretive over their economic statistics, which are probably you know unreliable anyway, uh, and they're also worried about the structure of the Soviet economy. And uh, because of that, they're a little bit worried um, about getting their money back. However, this does not affect them. Um, it does not affect their decision to transfer money to the Soviet Union regularly. Um, there's a uh, there was a researcher at the Wharton School of Business, which is at the University of Pennsylvania. The man's name is Jan Vanus, V A N O U S, who uh, published a study which is cited uh, by this article that American and Western European and all the NATO countries their shipments of grain and other food items, including you know tractors and and um, you know things for mechanized agriculture. He estimates that that assistance and trade with the Soviet Union amounted to thirty billion dollars every year, which again is proof positive 
that Western capitalism had built up the Soviet Union, rescued the Soviet Union over and over again. The Soviet government did not have the ability to feed itself, did not have the ability to build up its own economic basis. It required constant trade and assistance from the NATO countries. And something that Michael Massenduno, the author of this article, concludes is that this influx of cash to the Soviet Union never went to modernize the economy, never really went to alter the structural problems in the economy. What this money did is fill in gaps in the economic structure so that Russian rubles, Soviet rubles, could be free to invest in the military sector. All throughout the 1980s, this article states, German and French firms were building uh, aluminum, steel, and high-tech plants throughout the USSR. Now, the problem is this. You have major American firms, you know, ADM and Boeing, Grumman, uh, these firms who were afraid that Reagan was going to shut them out from the Soviet market. That Reagan is going to shut out American firms from the Soviet market and therefore Western European firms and Japanese firms will then go in and take over all of that. So the major um, firms dealing with heavy industry in this country who wanted to um, invest in the Soviet Union were vehemently opposed to Reagan's idea that Americans need to back off, certainly when it comes to highly strategic areas in the Russian economy. Now, um, in 1982, uh, and actually uh, several years before that, um, the Soviet Union announced that the Siberian gas pipeline project was going to be the cornerstone of their new energy policy that this was going to be the beginning of a series of reforms to modernize the Soviet economy by mining Siberia for, in this case, uh, natural gas, but it also included uh, oil as well. And that most of the technical know-how that went into the building, at least the beginning phases of the Siberian project, came from NATO countries. You know, this is something that needs to be taken into consideration. Ronald Reagan was forced to go to NATO and say, we are supposed to be at war with these people, and your firms and banks are forwarding cash and technical ability and expensive capital invest investments in Siberia when the Soviets themselves say that this Siberian project is going to be the cornerstone of their economic reforms and their new economic development. Again, Reagan had to back down. He had no control over the major uh, firms in gas and oil pipelines and refining that were in Siberia assisting the Soviet Union in building their infrastructure. He also didn't have any control over American firms who were over there doing the same thing. And as all of this cash was going into these major industrial projects in the Soviet Union from the West, from the people who are supposed to allegedly be in the middle of a cold war with these people. It must be very cold. It sounds more like an alliance than anything else. Somebody, you know, elected on an anti-communist platform can do very little. He, he eventually got passed uh, in the export laws of, of America that some very sensitive high-tech uh, military equipment could not be sent to the Soviet Union because the fact is that all of the major military suppliers in this country were shipping anything they could over to the Soviets. And so, uh, so some of that was considered a victory, but that did not prevent the major industries like coal and steel and oil and all the refining and infrastructure and transportation and all that stuff from setting up shop and assisting and trading and making a profit off the Soviet government. And all of this is happening 
We talked about this from the 20s now to the early 80s. All of this is happening while everybody in the West knows about the camps. They know about the mass killings. They know about the real Holocaust that has gone on in Ukraine and elsewhere throughout the Soviet Union. Huge population transfers and all forms of genocide that the Soviet government was responsible for. We were all taught that Hitler was the worst genocidal maniac of all history. But it's, of course, legitimate to trade and to back and to underwrite the Soviet government. That's the lie. That's the hypocrisy of the post-war West. The reality is that despite the policies of NATO governments, NATO corporations and banks were doing business with the Soviet Union, aiding them, and on a yearly basis, loaning money to the USSR. And the hope was to build a modern economy that they could trade with and make a profit from. If the Soviet Union wasn't going to shift capital for the building of things like, um, you know, personal products, consumer products, light industry, then maybe the West can supply the capital necessary to build, you know, soap and sneakers and, you know, uh, microwave ovens for the Soviet population. These kind of light industry consumer goods were never in uh, great supply in the USSR. But a lot of the consumer goods that were made in the NATO countries were shipped to the Soviet Union, but they were only available to Soviet elites. Party members, you know, professors, military people, uh, specialists in things like electronics and energy, and you know, very strategic areas. These people got first pick. And things made in the United States and Western Europe um, were uh, were available, uh, but only to the elite. But either way, Western capital profited from the Soviet Union, and it's hard to imagine how the Bolsheviks could had could have survived in power as a very small minority movement in the 1920s without this constant uh, infusion of capital and emergency loans and emergency grants and aid in the 1920s. Okay, so what are we to conclude here? I've just spent the last 40 minutes giving you the details of three academic articles from the 80s and 90s showing in painful detail the amount of money, investment, and aid that was sent to the USSR throughout its existence. And that's some of the numbers that these writers have either come up with or cited from other sources are huge. Billions of dollars in 1950s dollars being shipped to the Soviet Union as Americans are being killed in the Korean War and later in the Vietnam War. This has not been dealt with in detail because there's this mythology that there were two mutually exclusive blocks of countries. The Soviet Empire on the one hand and the American-led NATO Empire on the other. And that they fought something called the Cold War from roughly 1946 to 1991. It's not true. Now, I don't want to say that conflict between the Soviet Union and the USA was not a reality. We know that there was fighting everywhere from uh, Vietnam to Angola to Cuba to Nicaragua. We know that. That's true. But we also know that while these wars are going on, billions of dollars are either being shipped to the Soviets, being traded with the Soviets, and being sent as food aid and food assistance in times of uh, a failure of the harvest, especially during uh, Khrushchev's era, and the Virgin Lands Program failure, and everything. You know, Khrushchev was it was a disaster. But the point being that the West had rescued the Soviet Union over and over again, and you really can't look upon Soviet industrialization, which indeed was rapid. It was rapid in the 1930s. It was rapid in the 1950s. This development, you can't look at that development. <laughs> 
outside of the context of constant liquidity being pumped into the Soviet economy from banks based in the NATO countries. That's a simple fact, and I have proven it over and over again by citing uh, these writers and those that they have cited using all the documents available to them dealing with the amount of cash and technical expertise shipped to the USSR throughout its existence. So while a battle was being fought over the fate of many countries, especially in the third world, U.S. capitalism was sending cash to the Soviet Union, was trading with the Soviet Union, and was aiding the Soviet Union. One big conclusion here, I mean, other than the fact that the whole concept of the Cold War needs to be reevaluated, it's far more complex than is normally presented in the um, in the textbooks. But one thing that should also strike you here, I think, I mean, outside of the total immorality of this, supporting this type of government, while condemning Hitler as the most evil man in the world at the same time, is the irrelevance of governments. Governments either didn't have the will or the ability, and in my opinion it's the latter, they didn't have the ability to tell their most powerful corporate interests that they cannot invest in the Soviet Union and aid and assist the Soviet Union. It might be easy to try to put sanctions on a country like South Africa, by the way, an area that the Soviets and the United States uh, cooperated on, but it's very difficult to try to put sanctions on a country the size of the old Soviet Empire, uh, you know, stretching essentially from Bulgaria to the Pacific. But that governments and, uh, excuse me, uh, capitalist enterprise and banks are far more powerful than governments and they did as they pleased throughout the Cold War. And this is really just scratching the surface of some of the material out there and the documentary evidence out there concerning the underwriting of Soviet economic development by Western capital. The existence of this underwriting and this investment really shows that ideology didn't mean anything. Bolshevism didn't mean anything. Human rights certainly didn't mean anything. Profit was the only thing that mattered. American capital, Western European capital, did not see the Soviet Union as an enemy whatsoever. Uh, in the main, they saw the Soviet Union as potential as a potential market, as a potential um, society that they can help build and then profit from its modernization and reform. That reform never occurred. The Soviets just took that money that they were able to save and put it into their military apparatus. So the Soviet Union functioned the way it did in large part because of the infusion of Western money. And that is a depressing fact. It's a reality and shows that the U.S. government, uh, or I should say the U.S. Um, U.S. capitalist class has no morality whatsoever and is responsible, at least in part, for the murders and deaths and genocide perpetrated by the Soviet government. So um, that is my presentation for this evening. I thank you for listening and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.